And welcome back. And we are now at part four of this week's New Comics Bitches. So we've got one more pick of the week to talk about here. And that is the Manhattan Projects number two. Uh, so obviously Hickman's, you know, still kind of continuing his the great work that he's doing over at Image, the the really significant independent stuff that he's doing with Nick Patara, and basically, you know, we have in this issue. This is not following so much. We're not following Robert Oppenheimer in this issue, or is it Robert Oppenheimer? But we're following uh, really. Uh, really two people uh, in this. Uh, now, this, uh, I'm not, I'm ultimately, I, I feel bad, but I'm not familiar with uh, Dr. Richard Feynman. I'm sure that he has something to do with the Manhattan Project, but I just don't know in what capacity. In that, in that context, I felt kind of bad. But I do uh, definitely know who... Uh, uh, Werner von Braun is. You know, this is, you know, obviously they've given him this uh, mechanical arm, but regardless, you know, this is a man who ultimately, you know, kind of snuck out of, you know, he's one of the top scientists in Nazi Germany, and, you know, he helped develop, uh, you know, the V2 rocket, uh, the engines for the. Uh, they helped develop helped to develop the uh, the Messerschmitt jets, as well as and ultimately came over to uh, the U.S. At least I don't know if this is still kind of alleged or whether or not it's really based in fact that he helped to essentially develop the space you know to develop this you know to help kickstart the space race and help develop you know. The you know the Apollo you know the, the Apollo and the you know all the different projects as far as you know putting a man in space. So that some might some might say that this you know this pretty evil human being helped to progress uh, the United States farther than they could have on their own. But we have these you know Feynman is is very much you know he always. He feels like he's the guy. It's like he's the smartest, cleverest guy in the room. And you know, there are some points where you kind of see that he is that. But when you're in a room with Oppenheimer and Einstein and Enrico Fermi, and there's a great moment in here where I you get to, you get to see Einstein being kind of a sadistic prick, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, basically, you know, this is further along in the war. Um, and, you know, you got these cool little beats. And, uh, you know, I don't know who, uh, you know, Dr. Docklian is. I don't know who that is. Again, this is, I, I need to do more research. Um, but, uh, you know, again, these, these great little character moments. And, you know, but... You know, Feynman is kind of a is kind of a coward, but he's devoted himself to to science. And you know, even von Braun, he himself, you know, he says that there's nothing. You know, he's he's talking with Hitler early on in the issue, and he says there's nothing he's more committed to than the cause. And when the you know kind of German science stronghold is being attacked, and there all the scientists are on the verge of being captured. You know, von Braun says, "Hey, it's time for a drink," and you know, so it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be cyanide. And so, uh, von Braun does he? You know, he drinks just something regular, but kills everybody else, and he knows that he's a bargaining chip. He can live because he can. He knows that one of these things with, you know, that his, uh, you know, his, uh, his cause is not the Nazi cause, the cause is science, and science is all that matters to him. So, I mean, this is, you know, but they, they give, they, they, 
they give hints as to what may occur in the future here and whether or not this will be explored fully in this particular series because I don't know if the I don't know if the if the series itself is going to be limited I feel that it is I hope that it's not because I fucking love this book Nick Pitaro's art is terrific superb for what this book is he's not the greatest artist in the world is very kind of kind of frank quietly artist style but it's still unique enough to be his own and uh, and Hickman just is working the shit out of this book and it's just terrific I mean the first issue was flat out brilliant this issue really close to being the same flat out brilliant five out of five for Manhattan Projects number two. Well, so that's it for this week. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. There was a, one other thing that I did want to talk about. Yes, The Shadow. All four primary variant covers. Alex Ross, Howard Chaikin, the, the beautiful, my favorite, John Cassidy cover, and the Jay Lee cover. Now, of course, there were some additional covers. I was really, really trying to get the Francesco Francavilla cover, or one of his covers, the uh but it was only for it was only available for uh, Larry's Comics Inc. net and JetpacksComics dot com, so it's New England uh, comic retailer only. But there's also Dynamic Forces exclusive, which I was also really trying to get, but my comic shop couldn't get that one. Uh, Garth Ennis, Aaron Campbell isn't the artist. I've never heard of him before, but Garth Ennis. Preacher, Punisher, War Stories, Hellblazer, basically some of the greatest comic books that there have ever been, at least in the last, you know, Preacher is my favorite long-running series of all time. So let's delve into the shadow number one, shall we? I think we shall. So we open, we are in pre-war China. Well, pre, you know, basically, the Japanese have been, they've, you know, between, you know, it says, you know, right here, between 1931 and 1945, Japanese occupation forces in China killed 15 million Chinese people. Think about that. Think about that number for a few minutes. That's something that nobody ever fucking talks about. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, you know, 26 million Russians died during the Second World War. We had 500,000 in the U.S. We had 500, there were 500,000 in the Allied forces in Great Britain. Obviously, over 6 million Jews that were systematically murdered. But, I mean, still 15 million Chinese people that were murdered. That's not an inflated number. This is not pretend shit here. I mean, this is what Garth Ennis can do really well. What he's doing here is that he's incorporating something that he knows is good for this type of book. He's allowing himself to, said to to work with, within the confines of things that he knows how to do really well. He knows war really well and he knows vigilante he knows vigilantes really really well but what to do with someone who has somewhat mystic powers and speed beyond that of a normal human being 
See, here's the thing. Let's just talk about the story for a few minutes. Okay, so we have this reflection on everything that went on during that time period. And then we have, well, it's, pre, it's definitely pre-war. Nazi Germany is on the rise, you know, is on the rise. And we have the shadow. Cloak. Hat. Scarf. Cape. Twin 45s, all at his command. And he's ready to take down uh, Akira and Teo Kondo, which are, they are, they're, they're Japanese spies. And they're here, they're in New York. And they brought with all these strong arms to try and, you know, to try and protect them. That ain't happening. The shadow will have none of that. And as things progress, we are at the Hotel Algonquin, oddly, not the Cobalt Club, which is more traditional in the uh, in the shadow mythology. But the Algonquin Hotel in New York, I mean, obviously a pretty famous hotel, right? Dorothy Parker, everything like that. Um, but we have uh, Lamont Cranston, who, if you didn't already know, is the alter ego of the Shadow. And he's having his five martini lunch with uh, Landers and Finnegan. Now, Landers and Finnegan are American army intelligence, or they're American spies. And basically, they're working with Cranston to basically try and see you know, because Cranston has this information about the East, because that's where he spent most of his myths misspent youth. But what they, and he knows this information before Uncle Sam does, so it makes naturally makes uh, this Finnegan, who's the younger of the two, a little bit cautious, and you know, really just kind of wonders why does he know the things he knows? Well, again, he attributes it towards living in the East, but what it really is, because he's the shadow, and he has the fire opal, the girasol, the ring that he uses to extract information from his, uh, you know, from people who are, you know, it's basically a hypnotic ring, but it has additional powers as well. And once we leave the Algonquin, and once that conversation into you know securing Lamont's further assistance has wrapped up, we finally have this moment between Margot Lane, which is Lamont Cranston's constant friend and companion. Now, companion here in this comic and through Howard Chaikin's uh, uh, essentially, his his take on that relationship is they are lovers, but she is more of his uh, servant rather than an equal. However, she speaks pretty freely to him, and she is. A lot she knows a lot less about him than he does about her now this is just about perfect it's just about as perfect as you can get with a shadow comic this is gritty it's grim it's harsh it's uh, it's um, very violent. It's it encapsulates everything great about the shadow character, but also incorporating some of the things that are not so much about what the pulps by Walter Gibson were about, but also brings some elements of the clouding of men's minds, things from the radio show in. So I know I've only got a couple seconds here, but we're going to continue talking about this in just a second, and then I'll actually have 
like I said, my world premiere for you. So stay tuned.